Okay. Uh, so as after gaining proper information about the entire uh, background aspects of modern European drama, as well as uh, various things related to the school of thought, the theater of the absurd, we have understood a detailed elaboration of one of the foundational texts that fall under the school of thought of theater of the absurd, that's Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. Once we have discussed Samuel Beckett, it is indispensable to discuss Harold Quinter's work. And amongst Harold Quinter's works, it would be really beneficial to have a detailed elaboration on the work, The Birthday Party. That's why Harold Quinter. So as we uh, uh, tend to elaborate upon several important aspects, let us first understand what are the important things that will be focused on in this particular lecture session. The background, which involves an introduction to the playwright, Harold Pinter, as well as introduction to the play, The Birthday Party. The major themes of the play, summary and analysis of all the acts, character analysis, the stylistic devices, which involves theater of the absurd, absurdity and unique setting, certain important quotations and proper explanation of the quotations, and certain important questions that can arise out of our reading of the play, along with a proper elaboration on the answers to the same questions. Firstly, let us understand the background, that is an introduction to the playwright. Harold Pinter was born in, on October 10, 1930, in Hackney, a session of metropolitan London, England. His father, Hyman, and his mother, Frances Mann, was descended from Sephardic Jews from Portugal, who had around 1900 migrated to England after an interim residence in Hungary. The family, relatively poor, lived very frugally, like the other working class families in the area. Between 1941 and 1947, Pinter attended the Hackney Downs Grammar School where he began writing poetry and prose. He also took an interest in theatre, taking roles as both Macbeth and Romeo in school productions of Shakespeare. His education continued in 1948, where he obtained a grant to study at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. But finding the academy oppressive, he only stayed for two terms. In the same year, he tried to obtain a legal status as a conscientious objector, which he denied, which he was denied and was eventually fined when he refused to answer an army draft call. In 1949, when he continued to write non-dramatic works as Harold Pinta, he launched a career as professional actor. His work was a big actor for British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC's home radio Home service radio, from which in 1951 he moved up to a role in Shakespeare's Henry VIII, a production of BBC's third program. He also resumed formal training at the Central School of Speech and Drama. Thereafter, under the stage named David Barron, he acted with Shakespearean and other repertory companies in both England and Ireland. On tour, he met and worked with the actress Vivian Merchant, whom he married on September 14, 1956. The pair struggled to make ends meet and Pinter was forced to assume a variety of odd jobs, including stints as a dance hall bouncer or chucker, a dish dishwasher, a caretaker and a salesman. Pinter's first foray into playwriting came in 1957 when a friend asked him to write a piece of production at Bristol University. The result was The Room, a one-act play that earned the favorable notice of critic Harold Hobson and revealed Pinter's unique talent and technique. The work was not professionally produced until after The Birthday Party, opened and floundered in 1958, and it was Hobson's review of The Room's university production that brought Pinter to the attention of the young new wave producer, Michael Gordon. 
who decided to stage the birthday party. Pinter's first major su state success was The Caretaker, which in 1960 began a run in London's West End and won the playwright the Evening Standard Award. Along with The Birthday Party and The Homecoming in 1965, The Caretaker established Pinter's reputation as the major absurdist playwright and in the opinion of some commentators, his claim to be Britain's most important dramatists since George Bernard Shaw as recognized through his work, Major Barbara. In the 1960s, Pinter proved his diversity by producing a steady stream of both stage and media works. He began an extended association with the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1962 with the collection at the Aldrich Theatre. But by then, he had also begun writing cinema, adapting the caretaker to film. Although his creative energy remained unabated, unabated, he devoted more and more of two scripting plays for television and the screen. Some of these were originally written for the stage, but, but most were written for specific media. Some like The Pumpkin Eater in 1964 and The Quiller Memorandum in 1966 were adaptations from the fictions of other writers. A claim for his media works quickly rivaled that awarded his stage works and greatly expanded his creative involvement and focus. Although some believe that Pinter's best theatrical works were his earliest pieces in the absurdist mode, the playwright had remained a major voice in the British theatre since the early 1960s. If financial success and the diffusion of his creative energy have diminished his stage power, as some has claimed, they have no real erosion in his reputation as England's premier post-World War II playwright, his only serious rivals being John Osborne, as recognized through his work Looking Back in Anger, and Tom Stoppard in, through his work Arcadia. Nevertheless, despite some well-received plays like The One for the Road, 1984, and Mountain Language in 1988, the playwright has met with some decline in his political fortunes. It, is almost, it has almost become a scholarly truism that none of Pinter's works written for the stage after 1960s has superseded. The career, the homecoming, or the birthday party as Pinter's major contributions to modern theater. Coming to the introductory parts of the play. Harold Pinter was working as an actor in England when he stayed briefly at the dilapidated boarding house that would serve as his inspiration for both the birthday party and the room. As he has explained in many published works, he wrote more from intuition than that from intellect, exploring his characters without pre-decided narratives in mind. And this one encounter was inspirational not because of people he made there, but because of certain visceral feeling it gave him. Inter wrote The Birthday Party in 1957. After his one-act play, The Room attracted the attention of Michael Cordron, a producer who saw much promise in the quirky playwright. The Birthday Party is Pinter's first full-length play and the first of his three plays considered his comedy of meanest pieces. The other two are The Caretaker and The Homecoming. Committee of Minas, a term coined by the critic Arvin Wardley, describes a play which paints a realistic picture while creating a subtext of intrigue and confusion, as if the playwright were employing a slight of hand trick. Pinter once said, What I write has no obligation to anything other than to itself, which both believes the designation that Warden gave him according to his plays, which acknowledges the originality that inspired such a designation in the first place. Inspired by other unconventional playwrights such as Samuel Beckett, Pinter transcended traditional theater by staging a familiar setting, the English show, and then throwing it into a state of confusion which lies, deceit, and chaos. These juxtapositions would further be explored by Martin Esling in his seminal study, Theater of the Absurd. The birthday party premiered in Cambridge's Arts Theater on April 28, 1958, with Willoughby 
Reyes, P.T. and Richard Pearson as Stanley. Peter directed the initial productions himself, but Peter Wood took his place as director once the play hit the pre-London stage. Though the play was received well in Cambridge, it was a resounding failure during its run at the Lyric Opera House in Hammersmith. The avant-garde writing and the confusing subtext sat poorly with critics and audiences alike. Despite its initial commercial failure, the birthday party has since proven to be one of Pinter's most reproduced plays. It was revived by the Royal Shakespeare Company at the Aldwych Theatre in London in 1964 to critical success. Pinter directed this rendition of the show and later wrote, directed and appeared in subsequent productions, including the 1968 film version which starred Robert Shaw, Robert Shaw Stanley. The Lyric Opera House celebrated the play's 50th anniversary in May 2008, just months before Pinter's death. Coming to the major themes of the play, firstly, confusion and chaos. A key element of the absurdist theatre is its focus on confusion and chaos. In the birthday party, these elements manifest constantly, especially through its characters. The primary ways in which the themes manifest are through the ambiguities of lights and pasts. Stanley has some sort of a mysterious past that deserves a violent reckoning, but nobody really provides it details. When Stanley describes his past to Meg in Act 1, there is even the sense that he himself is confused about his particulars. Goldberg's name and past seem shrouded in mystery and delusion and make convinces herself to believe things about her life that are clearly not true. Further, because of these type of confusions, the situation devolves into total chaos. From the moment Goldberg and McCain arrive, the audience can sense the simplicity of the boarding house, which is about to be compromised, and indeed the chaos in the end of Act 2 confirms it. The only truth of the birthday party is that there is no truth, only chaos and confusion from which we make order if we choose. The next theme, of course, involves complacency. Perhaps the most pessimistic aspect of the birthday party is that if the only alternative Pinter gives to chaos and confusion is a life of apathy and complacency. The play's opening sets this up. Pity and Meg reveal a comfortable but blonde life in which they talk in pleasantries and ignore anything of substance. Stanley might be more aggressive than they are, but he too has clearly chosen the safety of complacency, as he makes no effort to change his life. His lethargic lifestyle reflects the attraction comfort has him. When Goldberg and McCann arrive, they challenge this complacent lifestyle until the whole place falls into chaos. Ultimately, Petty chooses to re-fortify the complacency of the Bojic house over bravely fighting for Stanley. Neither choice is truly attractive. Next, let us have a detailed discussion about the language used in the play. The precision Pinter employs in crafting his rhythmic silences is enough to justify language as a major theme. But he moreover reveals Show language can be used as a tool. Each of the characters uses language to his or her advantage. In effect, characters manipulate words to suggest deeper subtexts so that the audience understands that true communication happens beneath language and not through words themselves. When Stanley insults Meg, he is actually expressing his self-hatred and guilt. Goldberg is a master of language manipulation. He uses speeches to deflect other questions, to redirect the flow of conversation, or to reminisce about past events. His words are really wasted. Meg, on the other hand, repeats herself, asking the same questions over and over again in a bit for attention. Even though she often speaks without affectation, her words mask a deep neurosis and insecurity. These are just a few examples of instances in which language is used not to tell the story,
but to suggest that the story is hidden. In essence, language in the birthday party is a dangerous lie. Atonement, another theme of the play. One of the great ironies in the play is that it uses what appears to be fairly non-dramatic, realistic setting, which nevertheless hides the sadness of guilt. The theme of atonement runs throughout the play. Stanley's past is never detailed, but he is clearly a guilty man. He is vague about his past and does nothing to distract Goldberg and McCann. He does not wish to atone for whatever he did, but is forced to do so through torture. Goldberg too wishes to avoid whatever is there in his the way he tortures him, but also can fully escape them. His mood in Act 3 shows that he is plagued by feelings he does not wish to have. In the end, all the characters are like Lulu, who flees when Mekken offers her a chance to confess. Everyone has sins to atone for, but nobody wants to face them. Next, let's talk about nostalgia. Perhaps most fitting for a contemporary audience who would see this play as something of a period piece. The theme of nostalgia is implicit but significant in the birthday party. Goldberg particularly is taken by nostalgia, frequently waxing poetic both on his own past and on the good old days when men respected women. Certainly, Goldberg tells some of these stories to contrast with the way Stanley treats women, but the way they also suggest a delusion he has, a delusion that breaks down when he himself assaults Lulu between the second and third acts. He idealizes some past that he cannot live up to. Other characters reveal affection for nostalgia as well. During the birthday party, Meg and Lulu both speak of their childhoods. However, their nostalgic feelings have darker sides. Meg remembers being abandoned, while Lulu's memories of being young led Goldberg to bounce her perversely on his knee. Similarly, the characters play blind man's bluff, especially because it makes them nostalgic. But the sinister side of nostalgia is inescapable in the stage image of Stanley preparing to rape Lulu. Nostalgia is lovely to feel, the play seems to suggest, but more insidious in its complexities. Violence, as can be seen as a pertinent theme in the play, but the party is full of violence, both physical and emotional, overall suggesting that violence is a fact of life. The violence is doubly affecting because the setting seems so pleasant and ordinary. Most of the men show their potential for violence, especially when provoked. Stanley is cruel and vicious towards Meg, but much cowardly against other men. Both Mekken and Goldberg have violent outbursts, no matter how hard they try to contain themselves. Their entire operation, which boasts an outward civility, has an insidious purpose, most violent for the way it tortures Stanley, slowly to force him to nervous breakdown. In both Acts 2 and 3, they reveal how language itself can be violent in the interrogation scenes. Much of the violence in the play concerns women. Stanley not only intimidates Meg verbally, but he also prepares to assault Lulu. Goldberg, in fact, does assault Lulu. Finally, the threat of violence is ever present in the play. Even before we realize that disaster might come, we can feel the potential through the many silences and tense atmosphere. Sexual tension is also present throughout the attack, and it results in tragic consequences. Meg and Stanley have a strange possible sexual relationship that frees him to together very cruel. The ugliness of his behavior is echoed when Goldberg calls him a mother divine, quote unquote, and a nature. In fact, Goldberg suggests that Stanley's unnamed sins involves his poor treatment of a woman. Lulu seems interested in Stanley as well, but is quickly attracted to Goldberg in Act 2. His, her innocence makes her play to male sexuality. Her openness leads to two consecutive sexual assaults. And yet, 
she is nevertheless upset to learn that Golfer is leaving. All in all, it is a strange, perverse undercurrent throughout the play. Sex is acknowledged as a fact of life and yet does not ever reveal positive aspects of the characters. Let us come to the analysis of the play as can be seen in throughout the acts. If we talk about a detailed analysis of Act 1, we can find that birthday party is both extremely conventional and entirely unique. Most of the elements are easy to recognize and understand, but the relationships between two elements are slippery and difficult to pinpoint. Pinter's work is prized for the way it approaches and comments upon the limitations of communication. And birthday party is no exception, of course. The play, especially in performance, suggests that our attempts to communicate with one another are futile and often tinged with deep seated resentments that we are unable to fully articulate. The truth, in other words, lies in silence, not in the words character use. To best understand the play, it is useful to know about the famous Pinter pause, quote unquote. Even a cursory scan of the play will reveal how precisely Pinter uses silence and pauses in telling his story. While it is perhaps not accurate to interpret this silence as deliberately designed to communicate an idea, it certainly does create a general unease, a feeling of sinister motives that has become a hallmark of the writer's work. The theater of the absurd, as can be seen in the birthday party, opens with a traditional domestic scene of a husband and wife around the breakfast table. The specific setting of the birthday party is an English boathouse on an unnamed coast in the 1950s, but it also set within the generalized idea of quote unquote the home and quote unquote the family. In Act 1, we are introduced to the odd relationship between Meg and Stanley. When Petty is present, Meg, refer Meg refers to Stanley as that boy, a stern but, un but an affectionate choice for her border. Of course, their relationship is far more intimate. Pinter explores the difference between her relationship with the men through the motive of tea or making tea. Meg does not forget Stanley's tea, but she does forget Whitty's. Stanley later calls her a bad wife for sending her husband to work without any tea. And what is implied is that she is far more interested in having a tea ready when she is left alone with the border. This sexual tension is abundantly clear, though the particulars of the relationship remains ambiguous. Meg is much older than Stanley, which allows the reader to create his or her own details. Is Stanley taking advantage of the old lonely woman? Did they have a sexual relationship that faltered? An examination of their relationship reveals how ambiguous Peter's play truly is. As we move on the point further detailed elaboration, we can find out that even in Act 2, this elaborates and that too with further intensity. The most prominent conflict in Act 2 is that between order and chaos. The act opens with a symbol of order taken to an almost pervasive extreme. Mackin methodically tears the newspaper into identical strips. The symbol serves as representation of how he and Goldberg approach their job. They are insidious and deliberate in their infiltration of the house and not too quick to make their move. Interestingly, the same symbol will represent their chaos they leave behind when they resurface in Act 3. Even the tensions between Stanley and McCann also reflects the conflict. On the surface, both men do their best to subscribe to the social convention. Stanley is clearly unnerved and paranoid, and yet will not deliberately accuse McCann of what he suspects. Instead, he attempts to talk around the perceived threat, which further reflects the play's theme of imperfect communication. Similarly, McCann remains civil despite Stanley's bad attitude, at least until the letter touches the newspaper. By threatening to disrupt the semblance of order, Stanley insults McCann and leads him towards violence. As we move on to the next act, that's Act 3, 
Here we find a detailed understanding of not only the aspects of the characters, but how the entire play is filled with chaos. The structure of the birthday party seems to be very traditional. There are three acts arranged in chronological order, the first and third acts parallel to one another. As we find out both in Act 1 and Act 3, it begins with Meg and Betty's morning routine, although Act 3 reflects the pace descent into deep gravity. Meg does not have breakfast to serve in Act 3, and she is frantic to remedy the oversight. Yes, she does not remember to pour Betty's tea, whereas she forgot in Act 1. Because of what she has gone through since Act 1, Meg is ungrounded, not so easily submerged into the superficial routine of the beginning. In many ways, Petty is the central character of Act 3, since he changes during it. At the beginning, when Meg realizes that the drum has broken but does not remember how it happened, Petty simply tells her that she can get another one. There is a bit of dramatic irony since the audience realizes that the drum represents Stanley, much as it is broken. So he is mentally unstable. Petty's growth in the act is realizing that while Meg could conceivably get a new border like Stanley, his particular absence will likely shatter her fragile world. The play ends with his lie to her, a lie intended to prolong her eventual breakdown. Considering the implications that Petty might have a sense of the strange Meg or Stanley relationship, his desire to maintain her illusion reveals his discovery of Stanley's importance. If she falls apart, then their pleasant, comfortable life might also fall apart. This entire play, as we understand, has been written in accordance to certain important themes that have been elaborated out in the theater of the absurd, particularly talking about violence, be it sexual, be it mental, talking about the important characters who are constantly producing a repetitive arena of dialogues, even unable to come out of the cyclic repetition, talking about the chaos, the chaotic life they find themselves comfortable in, and the characters who prefer to remain absent, very importantly. Even if, if we talk about the stylistic devices, they have the theater of the absurd in its full swing over here. Absurdity, of course, very important as it can be seen through the undying uncertainty and the deliberate failure and also the conclusive and consistent information related to ambiguity and nonsense. If we talk about the unique setting of the play, yes, of course, birthday party uses a single setting. A living dining room of a seaside boarding house somewhere on the coast of England. Its anonymity contributes to a sense of place as symbol, especially in allegorical interpretations of the play. All the doors permit characters to enter and exit the room. There are features suggesting that the room is isolated from the world outside. The wall separating the room from the kitchen has a hatch, allowing characters in the kitchen to peer into the room, like jailers peering into prison cell. There are also windows that permit characters to see into the room, but give no real claims of what lies beyond them. There are very important understanding of the relationship between Stanley and Meg, and that too through the characters, how we study the relationship between the characters, how the state of the boarding house mirrored the actual personalities of the characters. How can we find out about Stanley, not only through Stanley and Meg's interaction, but also through Stanley and Lulu's interaction? How the stage directions are essential in the play, the stage directions tend to find out its relation with character development. Whether or not Pinter was influenced by the surrealists, surrealism being most important aspects of the play and all the plays pertaining to the entire domain of the theater of the absurd as surrealism needs the pittance of reality, which is then subverted. The descent of Stanley into madness, how it is getting described in the play and how this entire play through its certain acts 
appear to be a submission of the motivation of the characters. How printer had used and often prefers to use language as a buffer between silence and action in his plays. So apart from the elements of realism that markedly present the reality of the play, these are also certain important aspects, some questions, some matter of discussion that automatically comes out through our understanding of Harold Pinter's play, The Birthday Party. And a very important argument, of course, are Meg and Betty happily married? All these things comes out as we tend to understand various important quotations from the text, which of course serve as important aspect of this entire discourse. So with that, we come towards an end of a detailed elaboration of the play, Harold Winter's The Birthday Party. Thank you.